I'm in the uh, position of having to introduce myself today. Uh, I'm John Venary, I think you know that, editor of Catholic Family News. And the topic of my talk is the new barbarians and the assault on the family. And I'm gonna open with a, a remarkable quote by Hilaire Belloc. Belloc says, the barbarian hopes, and this is the mark of him, that he can have his cake and eat it too. He will consume what civilization has slowly produced after generations of seduction, uh, I'm sorry, selection, <laughs> generations of selection and effort, but he will not be at pains to replace such goods, nor indeed has he a comprehension of the virtue that have brought them into being. Discipline to him seems irrational, on which account he, can, he is ever marveling that civilization should have offended him with priests and soldiers. In a word, the barbarian is discoverable everywhere in this, that he cannot make, that he can befog and destroy. He cannot sustain, and of every barbarian into the decline of the peril of every uh, civilization, exactly this is true. Okay, so well, this is what we see now, the spirit of decline and destruction at work in and against the family itself. Now, we could have an entire weekend conference on this theme alone, the assault on the family, and there's lots of things that we could talk about. We could talk about divorce, cohabitation, uh, contraception, abortion, the rise of the, homo the, the homosexual element. Um, look at it for a lot of aspects, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on, I'm gonna focus on, um, oh gosh, I've got some pages. I've got some pages missing anyway. I'm gonna focus on an aspect um, that, uh, that deserves attention, and that is what is called the teenager and the teen culture. Um, when I say this from the beginning, I wanna make it very clear that this is not in any way an attack or an assault or an, a criticism of young people themselves. What I'm talking about is the structure the whole teenage culture, which is relatively new in history. It's really new since the beginning of the 20th century. And um, we're gonna take a look at where this teenage culture came from and how it is spreading and perpetuated and the fact that it is um, it's something new in history that we should at least step back and look at. Um, the author, Taylor Caldwell, she was born in England in 1900. She could read Shakespeare at the age of six. She came with her family to America in 1907, and she wrote of what she saw in the United States regarding her years as an adolescent, and she wrote that in a 1971 book called Growing Up Tough. She said, in America of those days, there was no time to be a teenager or to have adolescent turmoils. None of my schoolmates ended up on welfare rolls, during, even during the Great Depression, nor were any of them criminals, murderers, or whiners. <laughs> Our parents, even in America before the Depression, had been tough, perhaps not as tough as mine, but all happily tough enough. Okay, so there was a time in America, in North America, not that long ago, when we didn't have anything, we didn't have this thing called a teenager. So, where did this new creation come from? Well, first of all, as we're gonna see, it's, teenager's basically a Madison Avenue term. The first time it was used was sometime in the early 1940s as a Madison Avenue term in advertising. Now, the phenomenon that we know as teenager arose in around 1930, and even before the term teenager had been coined. And this is interesting, the main component in establishing the teenager and teenage culture was the, stab, the establishment of the public co-ed high school. Now high schools themselves are a relatively new invention, recent. Uh, the first high school in the uh, United States was in Boston, founded in 1821. Other high schools started to pop up as well. There were not many of them at the time. Relatively few, few people attended and many of the students who started high school, entered, didn't finish. And those who entered high school were considered somewhat of an elite. And I'm going to discuss a little later the 19th century American high school. This is rather amazing. Right? But anyway, then comes the Great Depression. 
of 1929, and all this starts to change. Most men of what we will call teen years were already in the workforce in 1929. My grandfather, for example, born in 1903, born in Italy in 1903, comes to the United States, and he got married at age 19. But by the time he got married at age 19, he already had seven years of work under his belt. But with the Depression, we see the job market bottoms out. It was nearly impossible to find work. And these young people were forced into the classroom in much greater numbers. One of the reasons why was to get the unemployment numbers down. So the unemployment numbers didn't look as bad as they really were. So by 1936, 65% of American adolescents were in a high school. And this was an all-time high uh, in, in, in that point. Prior to 1929, only about 25% attended high schools. And these public high schools, of course, were co-ed, at least in the United States, because the single gender high school had been declared unconstitutional in 1893. Then in 1935, we have President Franklin Delano Roosevelt establishing what was called the National Youth Association. And this was with the intention of getting as many youngsters as high, in, into high school as possible. Now, what you're going to see, what I'm going to mention probably more than once, is most of the research done on this, and the, what I'm going to be quoting, are not Catholic sources. They are secular sources. Secular writers, secular thinkers, secular sociologists, secular commentators are, who are stepping back and saying, let's take a look at what's happened here. Let's take a look at what we've allowed to develop. One such secular author, Grace Palandino, she does not have the Catholic worldview, believe me, but she writes of the consequences of the sudden rise of the number of adolescents now going to high school. Here's what she says. She says, quote, in the process, adolescents had become an age group and not just a wealthy social class, a shift that helped to create the idea of a separate teenage generation. When a teenage majority spent the better part of their day in high school, they learned to look to one another and not to adults for advice, information, and approval. So this is where we see the beginning of the teenage world. It starts to become a world apart, okay? A little nation unto itself. And there's another aspect of herding children into the co-ed public high schools that Grace Palandino does not mention, but that others see, and others see the, the effects of, is it defers maturity. It defers maturity. Also, by 1929, the whole purpose of the high school had changed from the original vision of the high school in 19th century. The first high school in the United States was, as I said, Boston English Classical School, established in 1821. It was later called the Boston English High School. Its declared aim was, I'm quoting now, to give a child an education that shall fit him for an active life and shall serve as a foundation for eminence in his profession, whether mercantile or mechanic. That was the first one. The second public high school in the United States was in Philadelphia on Aldi Avenue, not too far from where I grew up. Established in 1838, it was modeled on the US Military Academy at West Point. And these high schools at the time, as it, what they were is they were an alternative to college. It wasn't that you would go to high school and then go to college. The idea that once you graduated high school, you pretty much had all your education behind you and then you could enter the workplace. Now, Central High in Philadelphia, my hometown, was an all-male high school operating on the principle, and I'm quoting from them, that it could, quote, produce an educated men, produce educated men who were highly employable by age 16. And this is exactly what they did. These schools took the intellectual capacities of 12 to 16-year-olds seriously. They produced competent, mature young men who could take their place in the working profession at 16 years of age. I'll give you an example, 1849, a 16-year-old named James McKellen, who had just graduated from Philadelphia Central High School, he moved to Washington, D.C., and he became a U.S. congressional reporter. There are a number of 16-year-olds who, who, who followed the same path. 
Now, what was going on at Congress at, at the time? Well, during, at this time, what we had in the United States Congress was these fierce, passionate congressional debates about slavery. And young McKellen, um, he took down these debates word for word in the Pittman shorthand that he learned at the high school in Philadelphia. And for the next two years, McKellen and his 16, 17-year-old friends, ages 16 to 18, they created the official record of what historians consider to be some of the most important congressional debates in US history. See, this is what high schools used to produce. I mean, <laughs> do I need to make a comparison? Today, uh, the average thought of the American 16-year-old is, got my driver's license, dude, party. And adults are still asking the 16-year-old what he wants to be when he grows up. Um, meanwhile, uh, granted, now I want to say that the reason for deferment of maturity is more complex than what I'm saying, and I'm not ignoring those complexities, but I'm simply comparing the maturity level and the education level of the 16-year-old in the 1900s compared to today. And I'm not saying I was any better at that age. Uh, I, was, I was a project of the culture. When I was 16 years old, there were two things that were important to me. Getting my driver's license, I got my permit the day of my birthday. Getting my driver's license and playing Allman Brother guitar solos just like the record. All right, that's all I cared about, truly. So, but I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to be condemnatory of the young people because they are only following what we're giving them. It's just to point out that what we call the teenage culture is disordered, and we should recognize this, this, this disorder, and I think parents, and I'm a parent too, should think twice just about, think twice before we just turn over our youngsters to this modern pop culture. Anyway, back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, by the time, by the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, we saw changes in American education. Uh, colleges were setting up curriculum for high schools. So high schools then, instead of, you, instead of going to high school and being done with your education, high schools were being set up to be feeder, uh, you know, these feeder institutions for the universities, for the colleges. And um, what we then see, of course, is more and more time young adults spend in high school and more and more deferred maturity. So in 1935, along with this, Franklin Roosevelt established the National Youth or, uh, Administration with the goal of getting as many youngsters into the high schools as possible. And another goal of the National Youth Administration was to break down, was to, I should say, establish a break between the students' ethnic old culture ways of the families. They wanted to make an American youngster and, 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 and to break the ethnic ties. Now, the NYA did not state this explicitly, but it was implicit in its programs. One of the goals, Grace Palandino writes about this, one of the goals was to produce a middle-class American adolescent who was distinctly American. The NYA, uh, the NYA established residence centers where some adolescents would stay for up to two weeks, and here they would be introduced to diets, customs, and middle-class standards of living that would make them discontent with what they had at home. Now, on the one hand, of course, it is good. No one's arguing with the benefits and the good of, have, of, of taking people from strained circumstances and teaching them uh, into a better way of life. I mean, that's, that's, that's a laudable aim. But the way it was done in certain ways there was the danger of driving a wedge between the children and their parents. In ethnic neighborhoods, the National Youth Administration taught adolescents how to prepare distinctly American meals. Minute rice, right? instead of brajol uh, or, or pasta brajol. Anyway, the youngsters were encouraged, this is true, the youngsters were encouraged to cut family ties if old world parents were too demanding and here's what Palladino writes, he says, the most, she says, the most successful NYA participants were those who shed parents' poverty-stricken or ethnic ways and adopted a more natural American middle-class manner. Now, there was another shift that took place in the 1930s. 
The purpose of the high school was to prepare youngsters for the future life as an adult. This is how the schools saw it, and the parents who sent their children to these schools, that's how they saw it. Um, but there were youth magazines that sprung up at the time, such as Scholastic or Every Girl or the Girl Scouts original American Girl magazine. They would publish articles on how to make the right career choices, how to prepare for the future, various professions, similar themes, okay? But, and no one would be surprised at this, that's not what the young people wanted to read about. What the young people wanted to read about was themselves. How do I look prettier? How do I become popular? How do I become accepted in my age group? What about talking to boys? What about talking to girls? All these new concerns. And youth magazines soon realized that if they wanted their magazines to sell, that they're going to have to give the youngsters what they want. So this type of thinking causes a shift that made adolescents see the activities and the social life that they're living now as all important. So as the economy started to recover in the late 1930s, and with the outbreak of World War II, high school students, I'm quoting Palandino now, high school students were developing a public identity that had nothing to do with family life and nothing to do with adult responsibilities. This is the beginning of what we call the teen culture. Uh, young people started to adopt swing music as their own. Dances, preoccupation with swing bands and singers, what, what the singers were doing, this became a central uh, you know, a central concern in their lives. So World War II drags on, family life is increasingly disrupted because of the war, uh, the men are taken away, uh, the gas shortages and other privations cut some of the good living, cut some of the joy riding that the teens had adopted, but after the war the party starts again and it was greatly magnified by the post-war boom econ economy. And it was at this point right after World War II, that corporate America began to take notice that teen culture was a golden opportunity to make millions of dollars by marketing directly to teens. These young people in the mid-1940s and into the 50s, these young people had lots of free time, lots of money, and what money the children didn't have the parents had, and the marketing men knew this. Now, I shouldn't really say marketing men in this case, because the real pioneer of marketing to teens, the one who saw it first and finally convinced big business that there was a fortune to be made by developing a teen market was a woman named Estelle Ellis. She was promotion director at Seventeen magazine. Now, Seventeen, as the name indicates, was aimed directly at teens. But even in the early 1940s, some of the articles of this allegedly wholesome magazine would kind of pit youngsters against authority and against their parents. Uh, October 1944, okay, this is somewhat a mild example, but there's kind of a, a what appears to be a, you know, a groveling adult saying to the youngsters, quote, we expect you to run this world a lot more sensibly than we have. No group of adults who created a civilization which was blackened by a world war can claim to have done a good job, okay? Now, of course, we know that if Fatima would have been obeyed, there wouldn't have been a World War II. This is just a side point. And, you know, part of what's being said in, in this particular quote, uh, it's a pitch for youngsters maybe to take life a little more seriously, to get involved with civic discourse, uh, to give involved, get involved with the political process. For, that's fine, but it was not all that innocent because 17 also, here and there, I mean, encouraged youngsters to correct the old-fashioned ideas at home. For example, if a family had strict ideas on how home chores were to be divided, you know, certain chores, maybe the boys do the outside chores, the girls do the inside chores. <laughs> Here's what the April 1945 issue of 17 told its young readers. If yours is such a family, you have a job of education to do. The mother and father were supposed to learn from the teen that all jobs, cooking, cleaning, washing dishes, sh should be shared by, and this is the language of the magazine, all citizens of the home. 
And the youngsters were told to persevere in correcting their family, even if dad and mom don't agree. Seventeen Magazine said, remember, your dad is just carrying over attitudes that were quite acceptable in his youth. Now, close, close, quote. Now, despite what anyone thinks about the way jobs are divvied up at home, and families will differ on that, and you know, you know, that's not the point, what we have at Seventeen Magazine is Seventeen is encouraging the adolescent to be the moral conscience, to be the moral voice, and the moral enforcer in the family against the parents' old-fashioned or ethnic ways. And all this contributes to drive a wedge between adolescents and parents and to introduce a kind of disrespect to parents who teens will start to regard as ignorant and backwards and stuck in old-fashioned ways. You want to see a good example of this. Is anybody a fan of Flannery O'Connor short stories? Anybody? Flannery O'Connor has, has this type of thing. Um, we meet uh, these, these young people coming back from college like, like Asbury and Holga and, and Julian who are just nasty to their parents because they were told at the university that your parents are stupid and ignorant. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, and also, because of the satiric aspect of her writing, they're very funny too, even though she's writing about serious things. But what we have, though, my point is that this youth magazine kind of comes to be a rival authority of the parents. And here's the real point, though. Estelle Ellis from Seventeen Magazine was the first to recognize that the teenage market is an untapped gold mine for corporate America, and she had a hard time making the business magnet see this, and how she did it is a fascinating story. It's just amazing. It's, this, is, this is unique. Seventeen Magazine hired the professional research team of Benson & Benson of Princeton, New Jersey, to survey its subscribers to learn their tastes, to learn about their families, to learn what products they buy. And I'm telling you, this type of direct surveying and market research to this young age group was never done before in history. It had never been done before. Estelle Ellis, in a 2003 interview in the Journal of American Culture, she says it was like discovering a whole new, uh, 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 you know, a, a whole new nation, a whole new world, and but the real success of this marketing research was the way that the data was presented. Um, she did not; her final report was not one of these bland corporate reports. Sixty-five percent of the people that we, do, the, the youngsters, the, the young women that we surveyed, use ivory soap, and thirty-five use cashmere bouquet, and you know, and the graphs and pie charts and all those painfully boring things. Sorry to any accountants out there, um, but no, no stodgy graphs or pie charts. No, Estelle Ellis, Ellis <clears throat> excuse me, parked it, uh, 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 packaged, and published the data in the form of a market survey called Life with Tina. That was the name of the market survey, Life with Tina. Tina was spelled T-E-E-N-A, Tina. And she created this fictional character, Tina, who is a kind of every girl in the United States. <clears throat> so rather than a market survey with graphs and pie charts, you're getting a little story. You're getting a little story that you can read about Tina. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, and the market survey, <clears throat> market survey says, Tina has money of her own, and <clears throat> Tina has money of her own to spend, and what her allowance and pin money earnings won't buy, her parents can be counted on to supply. For our girl Tina will not take no for an answer when she sees something she wants in 17. And the market survey had a slogan, which was, Tina means business. Don't pass her by. Now at the time, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm okay. At the time, marketers recognized that Tina was an average American girl who was probably going to get married shortly after high school. So the type of products and brand names that Miss Tina buys as a teenager Mrs. Tina will buy as, an, as, as a married woman. Okay? So this was a means of establishing product loyalty. The survey noted that Tina influences what her parents will buy in the home, what her teenage friends will buy. 
She influences what movie the boyfriend will take her to, and she'll have plenty to buy for herself. Young Tina was an advertiser's dream, and the promoters recognize this. And most important of all, and this is what the survey says, she wants to look, and this is really cynical, thank you, thank you, this is really cynical, the survey says she wants to look, act, and be just like the girl next door. For Tina and her teen, I'm quoting, for Tina and her teammates come in bunches, like bananas. Sell one, and chances are you'll sell them all. Now, this really comes into play with the creation of rock and roll. Unlike swing music, which was music originally intended for adults, quality big band music, okay, it was intended for adults that the youngsters, of course, picked up and made their own. Rock and roll from the beginning was music for teenagers. The entire marketing strategy was aimed directly at teens, including, you know, the sweaters and the boots and the lunch pails and the hairpins or the hairstyles, everything that goes along with it. Now, rock and roll immediately became big business, marketing its wares to a target audience that had, again, Lots of free time, lots of money, and the money that teens didn't have, that parents had. So this only intensifies the teen culture as a world apart, a life of dating, increased promiscuity, rebellion, disrespect for authority, dancing, and more and more deferred maturity. So much of what created the teenager and teen culture was actually artificially generated, this is my, one, one of the points I'm making, was artificially generated by the movie industry and the record companies and other groups who were determined to make millions of dollars from the teen culture. In 1955, with the advent of rock and roll, teenagers accounted for 80% of the nation's record sales. 80%. Tina means business, and the record companies recognized it. Don't pass her by. Now, of course, one of the main reasons this paganized teen culture was able to spread through North America and the Ameri uh, United States, I'll just speak for my country, and it was allowed to, to end up to be a gold mine for businesses and corporations, is the fact that America has no national religion. The unwritten contract in America is that religion should remain a private matter. You go to church on Sunday and you leave your religion in church on Sunday and then you enter, then you enter the real world during the week. Catholicism was not the guiding factor in the nation's morality. Now, I will say in the nations, in, in the decades leading up to Vatican II, prior to the Great Collapse, the church was a strong factor that had to be taken into consideration in cultural matters, uh, consider, for example, the Legion of Decency with, with the film industry, but it was not the guiding factor. No, what was the guiding factor was what's going on right now, or what are the other girls doing, or what are the other parents allowing their children to do. This becomes the deciding factor of what is morally acceptable. But in the mid to late 1950s, there was one last high churchman who was of such eminence that in many ways he was the moral barometer of America. If he said that something was bad, the people of America would avoid it like leprosy. And if he said something was good, the people of America, most people in the nation would line up and scoop it in. And the name of this eminent American moral voice was Ed Sullivan. And it was Ed Sullivan who told us that Elvis Presley was okay, and it was Ed Sullivan who told us that rock and roll was okay. Now, Elvis Presley's style of dance and performance could, could, combined with this heavy beat-driven music that is designed to inflame the lower passions, uh, they were considered, really, he was such a shock when he came out and when rock and roll came out. Uh, he was considered so immoral, actually, that television, I think most of you know this, they wouldn't show uh, Elvis's, uh, they would only film him from the waist up. They wouldn't show his hips. Uh, there's, there's a Spike Jones routine where they had a, with, where, you know, <laughs> at the time, where they did a TV show where they, where they, where they showed, the, you know, 
their guest was Elvis's hips. It was very funny. They just had this, this cutout. But, um, but, but, they, but they would only show him the, from the waist up. And, um, but by the mid-1950s, what's happened? Elvis is becoming enormously popular. Teenagers loved him. Parents found him outrageous, provocative. Uh, they'd never seen anything like it. And, you know, it's, it's funny to talk about this because Elvis is tame compared to what's out there now, but you have to, this is the beginning of this revolution. But anyway, Ed Sullivan refused to have Elvis Presley on his program because he was considered so provocative. But what happened, Steve Allen, who had a rival time slot to Sullivan, he welcomed El Elvis on his show. So Elvis, uh, so Sullivan saw that he was losing ratings, losing money, so he offered Elvis $50,000 for three performances on his program. So Elvis cleans up his act so as not to look so much like a rebel without a cause, and, El and Sullivan introduced Elvis to the nation as a hard-working sinner, sis, <laughs> singer, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little slip there. Uh, a hard-working singer who loved his parents and who was a decent, fine boy. And Sullivan said, we've never had a pleasanter experience with a big name than we've had with you. So with that, Elvis had received the Neil Obstadt, the imprimatur. Moses has spoken from on high and he's declared that rock and roll is no longer an unclean thing. The rock and roll rebel, who parents had feared, was in fact a real, decent, fine boy, a faithful member of the congregation. This might have been partially true, actually. There, was, there might have been this disconnect, I want to say this in fairness, between Elvis the person and Elvis the professional performer. Because I know somebody who was in the, who was in the army with Elvis, and he said in the army he was clean living. And on the weekend he listened to gospel music. So, you know, but anyway, it was the whole rock and roll culture that he brought in. That's the problem. Whatever Elvis was personally uh, is kind of secondary. But anyway, Sullivan says he's a decent, fine boy, faithful member of the congregation. And Grace Palandino, the secular writer, says, quote, with Sullivan's blessing, the rock and roll business moved into high gear. Almost overnight, teenage desire became a respectable marketing tool and teenage rebellion a popular high school style. So from this point on, the youth culture was now very much the product of American corporations who would set the trends. They would set the trends and who made billions of dollars from teenagers and who had a vested interest in keeping the teenage market alive and thriving. And everything we see from that point to the present, the marketing of the Beatles, the whole bit, has followed a similar pattern. Now, of course, in the 1960s, we had the other layer, which was the whole you know, uh, hippie um, uh, anti-authority uh, movement and the whole uh, uh, sexual revolution, uh, revolution. I'm not going to get involved with that. But if you notice, rock and roll was very much part of this whole revolution. And uh, as far as setting trends, I remember, because I used to play music. I played in nightclubs for five years. And, uh, and, and the bands I was with, were, they, they were good. They were good. But I remember, but even then, I mean, you know, I, I tried to be a good Catholic, and I was, I was a good boy and all that, but I was in this environment. And I remember in 1979 reading, uh, I think his name was Cal Rudman. He was a major pop music producer. And, you know, forgive the crass language, but he said the theme of pop music in 1970s was boy meets girl. And the theme of the pop music from in the 1980s will be boy beds girl. Now, I remember seeing that and I was horrified. I was horrified on two levels. First of all, you know, St. Paul says the fornicator will not see heaven. Okay, so why are you doing this? But secondly, it showed that these men are setting the trends. They're not just, these things are not just happening. That was to be the theme of the music of the 1980s as it was. So the main point of everything I'm saying so far is we need to realize that in this whole pop culture, 
We have been manipulated and corrupted. Okay, we have been manipulated and corrupted, and this should disturb any man of goodwill. And we need to step back and just realize how severely we have been manipulated and corrupted, especially by the tween, teen, and now, I guess you know this, we now have the tween industry. You familiar with this? The tween industry. I have a whole, I have, I've been meaning to write about this for CFN for a couple of years now, and I can't seem to get to it. You know, Pope Francis keeps doing things <laughs> that interfere with my, with another line of research I'm on. But in any event, um, I have this whole row of, of secular writers who are writing about this intense marketing to teens and to tweens. And these are secular people saying, th th this is disordered. Um, I have one book, actually this is not somebody writing against it, it's writing for it. It's called Marketing to the 4I, 4L Consumer. Four eyes, 4L, four legs. And it's a whole marketing strategy to market directly to the mother and the child. It's a way of marketing. I have another book called So Sexy, So Soon. And it is this whole, and this is a writer who's disturbed at it, this whole intense marketing to tweens, to ages 8 to 11, to, to dress them up like street walkers. And um, so this is, so we have to, we, we just have to watch this. And as I said, not turn our children over to it. Um, today, of course, as I said, I had been talking about the 40s and 50s, everything is immeasurably worse. After 50 years of teenage culture, primarily formed by rock and roll, it has become increasingly more degenerate and that the most basic natural morality is thrown to the wind. This is a very important point. With all this happening and all this, you know, the, we, we, we <laughs> more and more degeneracy, corporate America now knows that if it wants to get the young people's attention, it has to be more outrageous, more sensuous, more blasphemous. Madonna is no accident. Lady Gaga is no accident. Miley Cyrus, that pathetic creature, is no accident. This is a direct marketing strategy of the pop music industry itself because it's got to grab the attention of the people, uh, of the youngsters. It has to drop to a new, label, new level of degeneracy. And as I said, this is not necessarily a Catholic issue. Uh, in 2001, for example, PBS ran a frontline documentary called The Merchants of Cool. Very interesting documentary. Here's, it, it was about this whole pop culture. The documentary opened with these words. It said, they want to be cool, they are impressionable, and they have the cash. They are corporate America's $150 billion dream. Now the document showed how many corporations study children, as one writer said, like laboratory rats, in order to sell them billions of dollars of merchandise by tempting, degrading, and corrupting them. This is a secular documentary. They uh, interview a, a, a New York uh, University communications professor named Mark Crispin Miller. And he really lays out what's happening here. He says, when you get a few gigantic multi, uh, a transnational corporation, each one loaded down with debt, competing madly for as much shelf space and brain space as they can take, they're going to do whatever they think works the fastest and with the most people, which means they will drag the standards down. Now, I've looked up Mark Crispin Miller. He's a leftist. He's not on our side at all. But he recognizes that they have to shock the teens, they have to shock as many as possible, and the best way to do this was more and more degeneracy. That's why Madonna, and then you have Lady Gaga, who's worse, and now you have Miley Cyrus, who's even worse. Frontline commentator Douglas Rushkoff says, today, five enormous companies are responsible for selling nearly all of youth culture. They are the true merchants of cool, Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Disney, Viacom, Universal Vivendi, and AOL Time Warner. These conglomerates sell 90% of the music in the United States, own all the film studios, all the major TV networks, as well as every single commercial cable channel. 
They are all competing for our youngsters' man money, and this is true. They even send spies into young people's groups in order to gauge what the teens are thinking, what they're looking for, in order that they can, they, they can market and create things uh, appropriately. This is detailed in a book called uh, Branded, The Buying and Selling of the Teenager. Now, what we have too is, um, we have the world of MTV. MTV. Now, someone, someone I know calls it moronic television, but it's, if it was just morons, it would be, it would be safe, you know, but this is, this is beyond. Um, what uh, uh, the, the documentary, Merchants of Cool, they talk about these new stereotypes created by MTV. Rushkoff calls them the mook for the boys, and the girls, he calls them the midriff, okay? Now, the mook is a teenage boy, and they show scenes from this. I, in some ways, I don't recommend it, but they show scenes from these scenes of MTV. The mook is the teenage boy who is crude, loud, obnoxious, unspeakably ob ob obscene, and in your face. And he's now broadcast all over the medium. And Rushkoff says there is no mook in nature. He is a creation designed to capitalize on the testosterone-driven madness of the adolescent. Now, you have teenage boys, you know, that's what they're like. They, they, they crash heads, hey, Bill, you're ugly, uh, you know. And what the day, they've taken that, and that's okay, you know, it's kind of funny, really, but um, they've taken that and they've pushed it to this unspeakably moronic, obscene character. The document says, the MOOC is perhaps Viacom's most bankable creation. Our young people love him. Once programmers discovered his knack with teenage boys, they replicate him across the length and breadth of their empire. Now the girls are dragged down as well, but you're not going to drag down girls with being acting like morons. No. This, the new girl that's created by MTV is called the midriff. He says, the midriff is no more true to life than the mook. If he is arrested in adolescence, in other words, he never grows up, she is prematurely adult. If he doesn't care what people think of him, she is consumed by appearance. If his things is crudeness, hers is sex. The midriff is really just a collection of the same old sexual cliches, but repackaged as a new kind of female empowerment. I am midriff, hear me roar. I am a sexual object, but I'm proud of it. And of course, it's a little dated by now, but who do they show here is a music video of Britney Spears. And what is the music video? She is a Catholic high school girl in a short, very provocative Catholic high school uniform doing a dance in a Catholic high school hallway with the lockers, and they're all girls, they're singing a song, and, the, and what they're singing is, I'm not that innocent. Okay, this is what's being pumped into our youngsters. And even Douglas Rothkoss says that this teaches young girls your body is your best asset, flaunt it, even if you don't understand it. Now, what happens is, is these low-rent characters, if we watch this, or may, we invite these people into our home, and of course, everything on MTV is a commercial. No matter what you see, it's a commercial. Now, in talking about this, too, uh, I don't want to just talk about the financial rewards and the whole corporate greed that's operating, though it's a very real aspect. We have to talk about the influence of the devil himself to corrupt youth um, in his hatred of God and uh, his his, his, he, he wants to destroy man who's part of God's creation. And where we see this is this... this uh, this warning that there are people out there who want to destroy the innocence of youth is not from, you know, Alex Jones or, or, some, or Don McIlvaney or some conspiracy newsletter. This is right in Pope Leo XIII's encyclical against Freemasonry. Leo XIII warns that secret societies strive to corrupt morals in society because when man is morally weakened, he will more readily come under the influence of their godless principles. So after speaking of stage plays, books, and pamphlets that are remarkable for license, that's his words, and of course they're tame compared to what's there now, here's what Pope Leo says. He says, for since generally 
No one is accustomed to obey crafty and clever men so submissively as those whose soul is weakened and broken down by the domination of the passions. There have been in the sect of Freemasons some who have plainly determined and proposed that awfully and of set purpose the multitude should be satiated with boundless license of vice. Okay, he wrote this in 1884. As when this has been done, it will more easily come under their power and authority. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a warning from a magisterial document, Pope Leo XIII. And I think a lot of you know the infamous Masonic document, the Alta Vendita. Now, I've written about it from the point of view of their subversion of the church, but there's another section of the document that talks about the directed subversion of society and their directed purpose to, to, uh, to corrupt women. Here's what it says. In order to destroy Catholicism, the Alta Vendita says, it is necessary to commence by suppressing women. But since we cannot suppress women, let us corrupt her. Tertullian was right in saying that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of Christians. Let us then not make martyrs, but let us popularize vice among the multitude. Let us cause them to drown in it by their five senses, to drink it in, to be saturated with it. That's where we are right now. To drink it in, be saturated with it. It's everywhere. You can't, the, the, the billboards. Make vicious hearts and you will have no more Catholics. It is corruption en masse that we have undertaken. Now, um, despite of what anyone wants to think about the influence of secret societies on this, um, we cannot deny that this widespread degeneracy called for by the secret societies exists, and it is cre increasingly through pop music, ho Hollywood, MTV, and other like-minded mediums. And also, I want to you know, stress again, I'm not saying, uh, this is not in any way an attack on young people or a criticism of young people, and I'm not saying that young adults were not always mischievous. Uh, we find this mischievous spoken of in literature throughout the ages. Shakespeare, The Winter's Tale, probably my favorite Shakespeare play, The Winter's Tale. The shepherd laments, he says, I would that there were no age between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest. For there's nothing in between but getting wenches with child, wrongdoing the, wronging the ancient tree, stealing and fighting. Hark you now, would any but these boiled brains of 19 and 2 and 20 hunt in this weather? They have scared away two of my best sheep, which I fear the wolf will find sooner than the master. Okay? Those of this age group are always mischievous, full of, you know, full of, full of uh, animal, animal passion, as it were, and uh, a lot of frivolousness, okay? That's always been the case. Anybody a fan of P.G. Woodhouse here? Does anyone read? No P.G. Woodhouse fans? Oh, my. Okay, yeah. Lawrence is, yes. But P.G. Woodhouse uh, is about these, these, these vapid um, uh, young uh, English aristocrats, ma magnificently written, uproariously funny. And one of the ants of this uh, vapid, there's Bertie Wooster, who is the Chiefs in Wooster, is, uh, he, he, that's, that's what P.G. Woodhouse created. And um, so <laughs> Bertie Wooster is this vapid aristocrat, very funny. Um, but you have Aunt Delia. Now his aunt is this large, robust, boisterous character. And here's what she says in the 1920s about the modern young man. The modern young man is a congenial idiot and wants a nurse to lead him by the hand and some strong attendant to kick him at regular intervals, okay? So that is her. So we've always had that the certain amount of wildness, frivolousness, inerrant in adolescents and young adults. And you know, no one is denying these, what you could be called the basic animal energies of youth. And I'm not saying, of course, that youngsters should have a cheerless adolescent life. Uh, we remember the father in Mary Poppins. The children must be molded, shaped, and taught that life's a bruising battle to be faced and fought. And he, he governed his home uh, with, the, you know, with the severity and the cheerlessness of a British bank. I'm not saying that should be the case of all. I'm all for, for young people. I have a lot of fun with my youngsters, believe me, for fun and games and get together and decent, 
dances and sports and friendships and playing musical instruments and energetic activities and music, not just classical music, no, but music that really is upbeat and kicks and all that business, Scottish Highland music. But my point in all this is it's not normal or natural for adolescents to be inherently rebellious, to be disrespectful of parents, and to be in a long state of deferred maturity and to live an active social life independent from parents, wherein they look to their peers and not to the family for advice, information, and approval. The adolescents get much of, much of this disordered behavior from today's music, television, movies, and uh, the average modern high school where they are surrounded by other teens who have unknowingly absorbed this, these toxic influences. Um, and this only increases, excuse me, <clears throat> descent into disorder and immorality and a decreasing knowledge and understanding of natural and divine law. Now, in fact, thanks to the pop culture and modern education, this, now these are, <laughs> deferred maturity is so extreme that the National Academy of Sciences in 2002, re, they, what they did is they redefined adolescence. They, now adolescent, is, according to the National Academy of Science, is the period extending from the onset of puberty to age 30. That's what they're calling an adolescent. Um, the MacArthur Foundation, around the same time, went even further, funding a research project that argues that the transition now to adulthood does not end until age 34. Uh, Diane West, she wrote a book in 2007 called The Death of the Grown-Up. Here's what she says, quote, more adults ages 18 to 49 watch the Cartoon Network than watch CNN. Okay, well, I'm not saying, saying CNN is any great, but you have all these adults watching the Cartoon Network. Readers as old as 25 and older are buying young adult fiction. People in their 30s reading Twilight and Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, and this, because this is written directly for teens, I'm not recommending it for teens, but I'm just talking about the age market. And here's what she says that I find very frightening. In 1990, the, av the average video gamester was 18. Now he's going on 30. 30 year old men. Girls, aim high when you're looking for a husband. <laughs> you get what you settle for, aim high. And if he's a video gamester, you know, you say it's either me or your Xbox. I mean, <laughs> and, but this has also infiltrated into the church now because World Youth Day is operating on these silly principles. It panders to the young people's rock and pop culture. And um, rather than, you know, talking about the type of things I'm talking about, and I attended World Youth Day in 2002 as an observer. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't participate, but uh, I was an observer. And the World Youth Day organizers, it's in their literature that they define a youth as between the ages of 16 and 34. I mean, that means our Lord would have qualified for World Youth Day. <laughs> it's just beyond belief. So there's a lot more that could be said. I want to wind this up. Um, and I do want to be writing more about this in CFN. I said I have this whole body of research material that I haven't been able to get to. But, but I, here I'm going to close, and I'm going to hazard some suggestions that parents can employ. They're going to be very general because as you know, even dealing with children, you deal with each child as they are. He's a, he's a choleric, he's a melancholic, he's a, you know, they're mixtures of all things and, and what, what you do for one child, you don't always do for another. So I'm not really going to get into particulars here. I just want to talk about some general principles. Now, in making these suggestions, I assume that parents are encouraging their, their children to the true Latin mass to frequent the sacrament, to cultivate the supernatural life of sanctifying grace, daily family rosary, I cannot recommend this highly enough, family rosary, modesty and dress, and the parents either homeschool or have their children in some sort of good school program, a private school or whatever. And also, of course, the teaching of the faith. We're going to have a, um, a catechism um, workshop this afternoon. It's, it's on your program there. We're going to talk about teaching catechism. Now, above and beyond this minimum, uh, we could have a whole weekend on this topic by itself, but I want to just make a couple of points. First, 
for married, for parents, consider the graces of the sacrament of matrimony. If we are married in the church in a valid sacramental marriage, we have a tremendous reservoir of sacramental graces and actual graces that are particular to the sacrament of marriage that we can call upon to help us to live, our, to live as Catholics and to help us raise our children in the faith and to give us the strength to withdraw as much as we can. I'm not saying build a wall around the house, but that, that causes more harm than good, but to withdraw as much as possible from the pop culture. There's a redemptorist father during the time of Pius XII. He wrote this beautiful little pamphlet called, Are You Using the Graces That You Received in Matrimony? And he reminds us that marriage gives a special, particular sacramental grace, and husbands and wife have the right to call upon this grace, not the privilege, the right, have the right to call upon this grace that we need light for the mind to make family decisions and strength of the will to carry them out and to protect, to work to protect our family and our children from bad influences. Here's what Father Tobin writes. He says, you have a right, he's talking to married people in a sacramental marriage, you have a right to the actual grace of God which you need to act in accordance with your vocation. The sacramental grace of matrimony will enable you to act rightly as husband and wife and later on, God willing, as father and mother. You will be able to depend upon special light for your minds and powerful strength for your will in order to fulfill your duties. Close quote. In order to receive this grace, Father Tobin writes that we have to ask for them. And we also have to cooperate with the graces when they're given. Pius XII once lamented that the grace of the sacrament of matrimony, he says, quote, it often remains an unused talent in the field. And the Pope encouraged Catholics, husbands and wives, to remember this grace and cultivate it. Most of the time it's not cultivated because we don't think about it. Second is, of course, vigilance concerning good companions. I remember I'm just old enough to have had the old sisters of St. Joseph uh, before their habits changed and before they became Dayardian basket weavers. You know, they were really solid Catholic teachers. And I remember telling them when we were very young, choose your companions carefully. Avoid bad companions. Because there's the old saying, and it's true, we become like the company we keep. Um, Father Austin Woodbury, one of the, he's unknown, he was Dr. Waters' teacher, one of the greatest Thomistic philosophers and theologians of the 20th century, he talks about the importance of good companions for children. And here's what he says. He says, the influence of friends is especially great upon us, and above all, upon the youth. For by the love of friendship, we penetrate within our friend, making his will our will, and holding him as another self. That's how close we get to friends. That's why we have to choose good ones. Make his will our will. And we are drawn upwards by a good and noble friend and downwards by a base and ignoble one. I don't have to prove this. We know it's true. Television. Now, when my wife and I got married, one of the things that we agreed upon, that we would have no television in the home. I highly recommend it. It is a freedom. Do we have a screen where we can watch videos? Yes. Do we only watch Catholic videos, Song of Bernadette? No, we watch other things too. I'm a Hitchcock fan. And, and you know, there, there, is th there are things out there. Um, but one of the reasons, of course, is, is if you remember, uh, we talked about bad companions. Well, these TV sitcoms that are on, usually the children are just little, rude little twerps, rude little monsters, and you don't want them in your home. Do you want Snooky in your home? Everybody know who she is? Good. Those who don't, good. The Jersey Shore creatures. So profane, so crude, so immoral, <laughs> MTV, that Snooky and the Jersey Shore creatures started to wear Aber, how do you say, Abercrombie and Fitch? They started to wear Abercrombie and Fitch products. Now, Abercrombie and Fitch have a rather sensual marketing campaign. When you see them, it's young people, and you know, it, 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 it has a very strong, uh, uh, it's, it's humid with sensuality. Abercrombie and Fitch contacted Jersey Shore and said, don't wear our products. We don't want to be associated with you. 
I know of a classical music group. This is, you know, I say this, there's no such thing as a safe place. A classical music ensemble, and they had a Halloween night. It was around 2011. And the daughter came home and said to her father, Dad, who's Snooky? All the girls dressed at this party as Snooky. See the influence that's there. And that's what I say, keep it out. You don't want Snooky in your home. You don't want people like that in your home. So anyway, um, of course, another, another uh, major concern is the internet. Now, every family will have a different policy, different ways of dealing with it. Uh, some, fa some families, they have one internet location centrally located that you're never alone in your room with your monitor. Uh, other places have Wi-Fi. If you do have Wi-Fi and you have young people, I would at least caution, turn it off overnight. Don't have that Wi-Fi going. Establish a curfew. Um, because, you know, what's, what, the Internet's a wonderful thing, but also there's access to things that uh, could ruin a young man, ruin a young girl for life. Um, so, and of course, rock music. Uh, I don't think rock music, this is just me speaking, I can't tell anybody what to do. I don't think rock music should be the soundtrack of our home. The proper order of music is melody, harmony, and rhythm, and they should be in that proper order, okay? And melody appeals to the intellect. Harmony appeals to the heart. Those old, you know, harmony love songs, and we feel our hearts start, ooh, that's so nice. It appeals to the emotions, it appeals to the heart, and rhythm corresponds to the lower passions. We see the proper order when a man is standing up. The intellect should govern the heart, and the intellect and the heart should govern the lower passions and not the other way around. The diff the, the, what we have to point out with rock music is, with rock music, rhythm is paramount. Rhythm is the driving force. Rhythm that inflames the lower passions. And now, of course, with so-called rap music, they've eliminated melody altogether. Um, and if anyone thinks I ain't cool by saying that, uh, there was a, a, Ray Charles was interviewed by out of one of these late night talk show people, and uh, uh, who's, who's a famous one? Um, he's been on forever, I can't remember his name. And I, I, don't, I don't have television, so I don't remember. But anyway, uh, he, said, uh, he said to Charles, uh, what do you think of rap music? And Ray Charles just said, it ain't music. And they, well, it takes talent to do that. Oh, well, you know. It took talent to be a torturer, a, a Viet Cong torturer as well, the talent of a surgeon. You know, what do you use your talent for? Do you use your talent for something good or something degenerate? So, and we have, of course, Keith Richard of the Rolling Stones saying, rock music is music for the neck down. You just bypass the intellect. Keith Richard said that, okay. So how, of course, you know, somebody I know who's a traditional Catholic music professor, and he says you should treat music, rock, uh, rock music like, uh, or pop music like, um, you know, like McDonald's. You know, you might go there now and then, but you don't want a steady diet of it. Um, and also, uh, I want in saying all this, um, you don't have to just listen to classical music. There's lots of music out there, and I want to war against the superstition that's sometimes found in traditional circles that wholesome is synonymous with bland. If it's whole, if it's it has to be bland to be wholesome. No, there, I never listen to bland music. We're a musical family. We play all types of music. Okay. The final point I want to make is that we should cultivate a cheerful atmosphere at home. Home should be a place where the children want to be. And um, I'm not saying again to build a wall around the place and don't let the children out. You know, because of all the, I mean, families are going to deal with this in a, in in, a, in in different ways. But I think the most important thing is is that the home should be a fun atmosphere. I'm not saying a lax atmosphere, but a fun atmosphere where the children are loved and where the family intercommunicates. I know of families that never eat together. They never eat together. Um, we have to restore eating together, table manners, where to put your napkin. All these things are part of culturally growing our families. So anyway, I'm getting into particulars. I didn't want to really want to do that. Uh, I just want to close here because I think I might have exceeded my time. So we see that modern pop culture is pagan, 
degenerate artificial. It corresponds to what I saw, said in the beginning about the new barbarian, that he can only destroy, he can only tear down, he cannot build. And for over 50 years, we have been manipulated and corrupted by the Estelle Ellis's and by the merchant of cool, merchants of cool. And you know, you have to ask the question, why is it that every movie has to have a bad scene? Why is it that practically every movie has to have bad language? If you were making a movie and you knew young people were going to say it, see it, would you do that? You wouldn't do it. Why do these people do it? Why do they insist on that corruption? So, the traditional Latin mass is not enough. Homeschooling, private schooling is not enough. In order to protect our youngsters, it's necessary to, as much as we can, to withdraw from the popular culture, and parents should think twice before allowing their children to become products of this teenage pop culture, we can really end up to be, and we've seen it, this pop culture can end up to be the greatest influence on their lives, and the pop culture is right now the product of the new barbarism. So thank you for your attention.